Hello and welcome everyone. This is Daniel Friedman. It's Paper Stream 3.0, and we're discussing the paper Genetic Determinism, Essentialism, and Reductionism Semantic Clarity for Contested Science. There are two goals for this discussion today learn about some epistemic and pragmatic implications of philosophical stances on genetics, and to prepare for upcoming lab meeting as well as to serve as a jumping off point and a foothold for people who want to get more involved in this discussion, because as we'll go into, we're only going to cover the tip of the iceberg today. So in creating some slides for this paper, there are three terms that come up again and again, and those are determinism, essentialism, and reductionism. And they're pretty much always going to have this consistent coloring, determinism in red, essentialism in blue, Sorry, determinism in red, essentialism in green, and reductionism in blue. And in thinking about how to represent the way that these different ideas are discussed separately and indeed have separate definitions, but are also enmeshed, I created this. So here we have a multi-dimensional space of determinism, essentialism, reductionism, and all these other axes that might exist. And we can ask who? What, why, where, when, how, what if, then what, what then? And we can ask different questions about this space, about what the different areas within this space might mean and about where we wanna be or where we find others. And that matters because whatever we think about this space, there's a moment of encounter. When we connect with another forager and maybe they're coming from a different place in this space, or if we think about a kind of recursive cognitive version of this space, these two foragers have their own perceptions of what that space is. And here they are meeting in some determinism, essentialism, reductionism, and other axes space, having a discussion. So before we jump into the paper, that's the big context. And these are going to be big topics and also related to human genetics. So. This is just the beginning of a discussion, and I hope people can get interested to continue it. First, some big questions that are addressed in the paper and some things that someone might be interested in that would bring them to reading and thinking about the paper. What philosophical stances do we implicitly and explicitly take in learning and doing science? What are implications of those stances? What stances are especially important for biology and genetics? That's what the paper focuses on, and we can also consider other fields like entomology, apodology, myrmecology, and so on. Another big question, what are these big ideas of determinism, essentialism, and reductionism, and how do these ideas manifest in genetics and in society? And last big question here, what are some similarities and differences with how we think about genetics in human and in other living systems. Which of the arguments and perspectives in this paper are valid across all simulated systems? What about all or some biological systems? Only humans? What about ants and why? On to the abstract. The abstract reads as follows. Research linking genetic differences with human social and behavioral phenotypes has long been controversial. Frequently, debates about the ethical, social, and legal implications of this area of research center on questions about whether studies overtly or covertly perpetuate genetic determinism, genetic essentialism, and or genetic reductionism. Given the prominent role of the isms in scientific discourse and criticism, it is important for there to be consensus and clarity about the meaning of these terms. Here, the author integrates scholarship from psychology, genetics, and philosophy of science to provide accessible definitions of genetic determinism, genetic reductionism, and genetic essentialism. The author provides linguistic and visual examples of determinism, reductionism, and essentialism in science and popular culture, discusses common misconceptions, and concludes with recommendations for science communication. Here's the roadmap, the structure of the paper. First, there's an overall introduction. The following sections two, three, and four 
are about genetic determinism, genetic essentialism, and genetic reductionism, respectively. Each one of those three sections, a triple helix, if you will, has a section called what X is not, what that section is not, as well as examples, and why the topic matters. And I'll read this note on the bottom of the slide. In the interest of time and attention, we will not be dealing fully with why X matters. It could be a good topic for a follow-up live stream. All of these connected ideas matter because our system of interest matters, that's biological systems and humans, because the truth matters, and because the process of doing and communicating science matters. I hope the discussion can open up space for many perspectives to comment, digest, and develop the attention and rhetoric presented in this paper and live streams. So in this video, I'll be focusing more on what these topics are, a little bit of context, what they are not, and going through the examples that the author shows. Let's get right into the introduction. So in the introduction, the first paragraph, the author begins with, the scientific validity, ethical permissibility, and practical utility of studies investigating the role of genes in human behavior and disease are hotly debated, both within and outside academia. That's everywhere. Studies focusing on genetic differences in relation to phenotypes that can be moralized, such as sexual behavior and drug use, that show racialized and socioeconomic disparities, such as educational attainment and intelligence test scores, and that are more commonly understood as cultural practices, such as childbearing, are particularly contentious, although no field of human genetics is immune from controversy. Citation 1. And so, Citation 1 is to Parents, 2020, The Inflated Promise of Genomic Medicine. And that blog opinion begins with, since its birth 30 years ago, proponents of the Human Genome Project have promised that genetics research would yield untold health benefits for all of us. Indeed, in 1990, James Watson asserted that failing to move the project ahead and usher in those benefits as fast as possible would be essentially immoral. The COVID crisis, however, offers a supremely unwished for opportunity to scrutinize the proponents' promise and to recalibrate the hope and money we invest in genetics. Such scrutiny and recalibration can be small steps on the path for fulfilling our nation's professed commitment to the health of all of us. So the author begins by situating this topic within a controversy inside and outside academia on sensitive phenotypes. Commonly understood as cultural practices, understood by whom, why, and how, and they're particularly contentious but contentious who and why. In the late 20th and early 21st century, much of the controversy around the uses and misuses of human genetics centered on the subfield of behavioral genetics. Citation two, Aaron Panofsky, Misbehaving Science, which used twin and adoption studies to estimate the heritability of individual differences in behavior and psychological characteristics, including cognitive abilities, personality, and psychopathology. Citation 3. Polterman et al. Meta-analysis of the heritability of human traits based on 50 years of twin studies in Nature Genetics in 2015. Notoriously, results on the heritability of human racial... Sorry. Notoriously, results on the heritability of human individual differences were misused to advance the idea that economic and racial inequalities were immutable. immutable. Citations 4 and 5. Citation 4, Arthur Jensen, 1969, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? And Citation 5, from 2020, Charles Murray, Human Diversity, The Biology of Gender, Race, and Class. The next two slides, I'm going to give a short historical context. And again, it's the beginning of important discussions and ongoing discussions. So just to give a little peek into this social and why it matters and history angle before returning for the rest of the stream, pretty much to just the text of the paper. So there's a lot of ways to pull back and uh, places to pull back too, but one appropriate place, or at least interesting area is this book by J. David Archibald, Aristotle's Ladder, Darwin's Tree, The Evolution of Visual Metaphors for Biological Order. And this book 
describes other than taking a really creative perspective on the role of visual images in biology and theory, discussing the transition from this type of ladder or linear or scala natura ordering of the certain uh, understanding of the natural world into a tree-like understanding, which is also certain. It's also particular in a certain way. So they're both encultured practices, they're sense-making heuristics, they're structural metaphors for the just wealth and types of biodiversity that we see around us. And so here in the Scala Natura in the center, we see human in the center with things like angels and God above and things that are less worthy or less living or just different, simpler below. And then in the tree motif, we see there's the thick tree containing the evolutionary status of different individual species and types. And then even at the top of the tree, we see this kind of fractal relationship with the mammals and the primates and man is on the top in the center of the tree in that visual metaphor. And we can connect that to a recent paper of Lynx, Fair and Johnson, Rethinking the Social Ladder Approach for Elucidating the Evolution and Molecular Basis of Insect Societies. So we can think about broadly in science and society, movements from ladder-like linear representations on towards tree-like representations through on to higher dimensional and to network-like representations, work that's not shown here. Why does this matter? Well, as we think about humans as natural systems, our modes of thinking scientifically, explicitly and implicitly end up shaping and being in feedback with the kinds of science that we do and how we communicate it. So where does that tree metaphor become mobilized? Here's an example within the history of eugenics. And we can start on this image of the tree on the top left. And here's a very interesting colorized version. But the tree says eugenics. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. Like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. And here's a colorized version of that image. And I wrote out what these roots are. So under the main branch of genetics, we have anatomy, biology, physiology, psychology. Under the root of anthropology, we have mental testing, anthropometry, history, geology, archaeology, ethnology, geography. Under the branch of statistics, we have law, politics, and economics. And under the branch of genealogy is biography, sociology, medicine, surgery, psychiatry, education, and religion. And then on the right is a slightly different variant of this eugenics tree, and it has some different roots named. For example, here's migration, fecundity, race crossing, environment, and so on. So this tree metaphor does become mobilized in the context of eugenics, and it ends up having real consequences for how science is done and how science is communicated. And one work of many, many that go into this is Edwin Black's War Against the Weak, Eugenics and America's Campaign to Create a Master Race. This has to do with the history of eugenics in the United States of America, which is the context that I'm most familiar with. Here's an image of the legislative status of eugenical sterilization in the United States uh, up to 1935 and the tens of thousands of documented and unknown other things that happened across the lower 48. And again, to return to the ways that this looked in public and the ways that this was implemented, here we see an agricultural metaphor for human genetic diversity. Only healthy seed must be sown. Check the seeds of hereditary disease and unfitness by eugenics. And another visual from that era coming from um, a blog post on the visual imagery of eugenics. Release the stranglehold of hereditary disease and unfitness. And here we quite literally see that tree and the hand coming in from the right with the pliers, cutting this vine, strangling the tree. And so that's how we see it being visually represented. 
And just to give one document as to what it looks like procedurally, here are some of the effects of eugenic sterilization as practiced in California from a Human Betterment Foundation in Pasadena, California. It describes some of their perceived advantages and outcomes and rationale for why eugenic practices in terms of state sterilization were practiced in California. So really important topic. And again, it's not my area of expertise, but I hope to facilitate and be involved in the discussion on it. Because when one takes a look at this list of different fields, this reads like a transdisciplinary synthesis. And so the trunk of that tree, the synthesis that we make with these fields is the ethics of the time and the ethics of the people and the decision-making that they actually use the science for. So I'm not a sound biter, but science is not providing ethics. It's not telling us what to do with these roots. And that's something that seriously needs to be grappled with. And this paper starts to set the semantic playing field, at least in one's perspective, for that discussion to be continuing. So back to the paper. They write, this interpretation of behavioral genetic results was widely condemned as not just politically and morally unpalatable, but also as scientifically incorrect. So here are four reasons that the author is listing for why these perspectives that were controversial, citation four and citation five, why those beliefs are not just morally and politically unpalatable, but also scientifically incorrect. One, even highly heritable phenotypes can be modified via environmental change. Two, the heritability of individual differences within a group implies nothing about the source or even the direction of between group differences. And there is far more genetic variation within socially defined racial groups than there are between them. And four, heritabilities could arise at least partly via social processes rather than solely with, via with inside the skin cellular mechanisms. As will become clear in this perspective, points one and two about modification, change, source, and direction of differences are arguments against genetic determinism. Point three about variation patterns within and between groups is an argument against genetic essentialism and heritability arising at least partly via top-down or social processes is an argument against genetic reductionism. The introduction continues. Whereas the first years of GWAS research, genome-wide association study research, focused mainly on biomedical phenotypes, such as blood lipid levels or Crohn's disease, citation seven, Vischer et al., 2010, 2017. GWAS are increasingly used to study social and behavioral phenotypes, including educational attainment, cognitive ability, sexual behavior, childbearing, substance use, and the symptoms of mental disorders. This subfield of research, which has fuzzy boundaries and which generally uses the same research methodologies as the larger fields of complex trait genetics has been termed social and behavioral genetics. Martyshenko, 2021. In contrast to earlier candidate gene research, social and behavioral genomics research has successfully identified replicable genetic associations with behavioral phenotypes, although the mechanisms that produce these associations remain largely unknown. Moreover, for some phenotypes, the variants statistically accounted for by identified genetic variants now rivals the variance accounted for by variables more typically considered in social science, which is to say the top-down factors. And here's a slide from the NIH on genome-wide association study, for those who aren't familiar. In this simple two-group genome-wide association study, there are individuals with the disease and individuals without a disease. The variation in their DNA genome is measured at different points, and then there's a statistical testing process by which after correcting and normalizing and sifting and sorting a bunch of different things, depending on the methodology, different regions of genetic variants and different specific genetic variants are identified that can be associated with the disease. Now, correlation is not causation. And of course, statistical models of causation are complex. We've talked about Bayes graphs elsewhere, but that's the rough logic for this kind of experiment. And there are more nuanced versions of the experiment that aren't simply two group as well. The final paragraph of the introduction reads, 
As the pace of genetic discovery has accelerated, so too has the demand for researchers to communicate their results in ways that avoid the, quote, isms, genetic determinism, genetic essentialism, and genetic reductionism that were characteristic of earlier misuses of behavioral genetic research. Citation 12. Genetic Determinism Rides Again. It's a book review by Nathaniel Comfort about the book Blueprint, How DNA Makes Us Who We Are by Robert Plomin. To achieve this goal, it is necessary for there to be consensus and clarity about the meaning of these terms. Here, the author is going to state their aims for the paper. Here, I give an accessible definition of genetic determinism, essentialism, and reductionism. Review psychological research on why the idea might be politically or socially consequential. Provide examples from scientific papers in popular culture that imply indeterminist, anti-essentialist, or anti-reductionist ideas and conclude with recommendations for scientific communication and critique. So now on to the three sections of the paper. First, determinism. But I'm leaving essentialism and reductionism small to remind us that, again, we're in a space of ideas that includes all these three ideas and many, many more. And the adversary does not necessarily care about conceptual coherence. And where they do, they may or may not even be using your ontology. So all the ideas are in play at all times. What is determinism? Determinism is a philosophical term about the causal structure of the universe and has been defined as follows. The world is governed by determinism if and only if, given a specified way things are at time t, the way things go thereafter is fixed as a matter of natural law. Carrying this forward, genetic determinism can therefore be defined as follows. A phenotype is governed by genetic determinism if and only if, given a specified genotype, the way the phenotype develops thereafter is fixed as a matter of natural law. A genetically determined phenotype, according to this definition, is a necessary occurrence. If one knows the genotype, then one can foretell the phenotype with a very high degree of certainty, regardless of social or environmental context. So, this is obviously an extreme case of high heritability across multiple examined contexts. That's going to be referred to as causal specificity. Of course, causal specificity is conditional on environmental settings, it's complex, and it's on a continuum. But where and how do we think about different traits that are in different parts of the space of causal specificity in different environmental settings? And again, that's way, way even before we get to the actionable consequences or the moral sentiment on people and their genetic and phenotypic diversity, but here only thinking about what the determinism means itself. Using philosopher Ned Block's example of the number of fingers, having five fingers on each hand is genetically determined, because if one has a specified genotype, then one will almost invariably develop five fingers on each hand as a matter of natural law. I don't know how I feel about the natural law framing. I don't think that the law metaphor makes sense here, but there are definitely genotypes that in certain environmental settings lead to more or less concordance in the number of fingers. By contrast, specificity is low, and the conclusion that the phenotype is genetically determined is unsupported if, for the same state of genotype, there are many states of outcomes. Educational attainment, for example, is not genetically determined because people who have the same genotype can have numerous differential educational outcomes, and there are many educational outcomes that cannot be produced by changing someone's genotype. Citations provided below for what the author uses. So that's what determinism is. In this context, it's being used to mean causal specificity in the extreme case, meaning that there's a complete concordance between genotype at one time point and phenotype at future time points, and in some other extreme case, there's no concordance, and then everything else is in the middle. Here's what determinism is not. Genetic determinism as a concept does not map to heritability. Well, what does it mean to map? Can't we map any idea? Some phenotypes, such as Huntington disease and other Mendelian disorders, are both genetically determined and are 100% heritable. So in other words, variation within the population is associated with variation at specified loci, 
and those specified loci do have a determinate, deterministic role in the phenotypic generation. Some phenotypes, such as the number of fingers, are genetically determined but not at all heritable because there's little to no variation in the relevant genes in the population being studied. So heritability has to do with variation explained with association by pedigree, but we just learned about a variant that does change the number of fingers. So I'm unsure on why the number of fingers is said to be not at all heritable when, of course, heritability is always an environment and cohort-specific calculation, but here it's just described that there are variants that do ostensibly heritably, intergenerationally, result in differences in the number of fingers. Still other phenotypes, such as educational attainment, are heritable but not genetically determined. Inheritability is contingent on the environmental context, historical time, and social structure. Well, that sums up all traits in some way. Because heritability does not imply determinism, and de determinism does not imply heritability, attempts to ground definitions of genetic determinism in heritability and to infer a scientist's beliefs about genetic determinism from their discussion of heritability are mistaken. So, the author is making a point to distinguish between heritability as a statistical concept and determinism used in this causal specificity sense. And, always a great discussion, what is heritability in the narrow and broad senses and some of the citations used. Genetic determinism must also be distinguished from genetic causation. In, in, manipulate, in manipulationist, counterfactual and or potential outcome understandings of causation, which are de rigueur, the norm, across scientific fields, X is considered A or not the cause of Y if a change in X would change the probability of Y occurring, even if the change in X is neither necessary nor sufficient to guarantee that Y occurs. And then there's more discussion here. And the citation is to 22, an earlier work by Hardin. Um, in this earlier work, they uh, say the following. This is in the Har uh, Mandoli and Hardin 2022, Building Causal Knowledge in Behavioral Genetics. In this paper, we advance a framework for identifying instances of genetic causes interpreting those causal relationships and applying them to advance causal knowledge more generally in the social science. Central to thinking about genes as causes is counterfactual reasoning, the cornerstone of causal thinking in statistics, medicine, and philosophy. We argue that within family, genetic effects represent the product of a counterfactual comparison in the same way as average treatment effects from randomized control trials. So that's pretty interesting in terms of a mapping between these different types of scientific knowledge and experiments. Both average treatment effects from randomized control trials and within family genetic effects are shallow causes. They operate within intricate causal systems, produce heterogeneous effects across individuals, and are not mechanistically informative. Despite these limitations, shallow causal knowledge can be used to improve understanding of the etiology of human behavior and to explore sources of heterogeneity and fade out in treatment effects. And so just some more fundamental philosophy to look at on the bottom right is Causes That Make a Difference by Kenneth Waters, which is uh, in the literature on philosophy of biology about what causes are. And then uh, the work of Jay Griesmer, one of my previous professors at UC Davis, and he's written many more recent papers, but I just wanted to highlight these two papers from 1988 to show where he was thinking about things about 30 plus years ago. And the paper's titles are Causal Explanation in Laboratory Ecology, The Case of Competitive Indeterminacy with MJ Wade and the paper Laboratory Models, Causal Explanation and Group Selection. So there's a really interesting literature about causal modeling in biology, and there's a distinguishment that the author is making in our focal paper between genetic determinism and genetic causation, but they're definitely related because they relate to how we think about what happens given one other thing happening. From the section of the paper, 
examples of genetic determinism and indeterminism. Genetic determinism is commonly implied or claimed outright in media coverage of genetic studies. For example, a news article in Science was titled, Genes Don't Just Influence Your IQ, They Determine How Well You Do in School, Citation 23. Whereas an article in MIT Technology Review was titled, Forecasts of Genetic Fate Just Got a Lot More Accurate, 24. The language of genetic fate implies that a person's phenotype is knowable given knowledge of their genotype, rather than, as is the case for any behavioral or psychological phenotype, being dynamically responsive to environmental conditions and subject to developmental variability. Now, if it turns out that over the years, we are getting more accurate at reducing our uncertainty at using DNA and other kinds of measurements to make predictions, not fundamental, errorless, context-free, non-dynamic predictions, but rather conditions that are taken into account, developmental trajectories taken into account, and probabilistic predictions, if those predictions or forecasts are getting more accurate, then what is the issue here? Not using the word genetic fate, so what should be used? How should it be described? And some recommendations from the author. In scholarly work in science communication, researchers can avoid implying genetic determinism with text and visual displays that highlight unpredictability or uncertainty in the prediction of an individual's phenotype from their genotype and that highlight instability or contingency of genotype-phenotype relationships. So, as a visual example, figure 1 presents two ways of graphing the same association with a polygenic score. Figure 1a shows the full range of individual variability around a given value of the polygenic score and conveys more uncertainty in the genotype-phenotype relationship than figure 1b, which focuses on average outcomes by deciles of the polygenic score. In some cases, focusing on extreme subgroups with very different expected values for the phenotype might be useful clinically and or scientifically. But even in these cases, researchers should still be mindful that presentations of individual level data might be helpful in combating deterministic biases. Presenting individual level data also answers more general calls for greater transparency in data visualization. So on the left side in figure 1a, we have a cloud of points and on the uh, x-axis is the score percentile, do note the scale, of a polygenic predictor that is made from genetic diversity amongst individuals where points are individuals, and the performance on some tests, the GCSE, is on the y-axis. And so overall, there's a lot of scatter. However, it turns out that there's a positive relationship. The regression line is positive here. And there's two ways that we can look at this data that the author is highlighting. The first is the full scatter plot, which they point out at the end is also just consistent with broader principles of like visualizing how many samples are included in a given statistical test. However, another valid visualization that you can draw from this exact data set is you can summarize the deciles on the x-axis and then plot the mean and variance of the score percentile on the y-axis and that results in this seemingly continuous um, increase with some slight changes in the bottom three deciles as the polygenic predictor score goes up the actual score on the test goes up and that's because the polygenic predictor is quite literally predicting this y-axis. So this is always something that exists in regressions. So these two are both views on the same data set, and the author is claiming that not just do they show different information scientifically, but they highlight different beliefs that people are going to have about determinism. For example, thinking that somebody who's in the nth decile, the sixth decile, near the 50th point. Well, they could be anywhere from one of the highest performers to one of the lowest performers on this test. But there's a difference in the mean and the variance um, such that it's significantly different from another decile, but that may or may not have any ability to describe the determinism around one individual person in the author's argument. On to the second of the three categories, essentialism. So, genetic essentialism. 
Essentialism is the belief that things have essences, one or more deep underlying characteristics without which the thing or person would not be what it is, and that these essences explain why certain individual things or people are appropriately considered members of the same category. That is, essentialism is a theory that structures how concepts and categories are organized, including social categories such as gender or race. Thus, while determinism is a belief about why something comes to be, essentialism is a belief about what makes things similar to or unlike another thing. For example, one holding a determinist belief will overlook environmental influences such as sun exposure and believe that skin tone is genetically determined. One holding an essentialist belief will believe that people who have a similarly dark skin tone share an underlying essence, such that their superficial similarity reflects a deeper property that explains what they are all, quote, really like. So, to the beginning citations on essentialism, we have 35 and 36 citations. And genetic essentialism, then, is a particular type of essentialist thinking, where the essence that constitutes what a person or thing really is, or that links various particulars to a single category, is some real or imagined DNA sequence. So, that's the definition of genetic essentialism. And it's interesting to think about where do we go fundamentally with essentialism when we talk about process ontologies rather than object or essentialist ontologies. What about using systems thinking, complexity, and so on? The author continues. Psychological studies have identified two major dimensions of essentialism, naturalness and entitivity. Entitivity. Not sure how to say it. The first dimension, naturalness, is most relevant to genetics and encompasses the belief that a group is biological, discrete, stable, that group membership is immutable, and requires necessary characteristics. So, naturalness has to do with the clean, unchanging nature of members of that category. Just the cleanest possible setting. The second dimension, entitativity, encompasses the belief that groups are highly similar or uniform, exclusive, inherent, and that knowledge of group membership is informative about many characteristics of group members. So these are the two dimensions that have been pulled out by citation 38, and they focus on a few different identities and different issues on the bottom left looking at how the naturalness and entitativity beliefs are relatively independent in the discussions that they have on white racial identity and political groups. They go on. Essentialism about the self can be considered a special case of categorization. The feelings, experiences, preferences, interests, attitude, values, and motivations that describe me at any one point in time can shift from moment to moment, from year to year. But despite the differences between 20-year-old page and 40-year-old page, I nonetheless perceive these variable psychological states to be reflective of a single coherent I rather than as a disparate constellation of unlike things. What constitutes this I? In genetic essentialism, the individual's genome is taken not only to cause characteristics and typical behaviors, but to represent the very essence of the individual's identity. So, kind of a self-reflective life crisis meaning investigation, but an interesting jumping off point for discussion. What is the I? What is I am a strange loop? What is Gertel Escherbach? Here's what essentialism is not. Genetic essentialism is related to, but distinct from genetic determinism. Essentialist thinking involves beliefs that category membership is stable, immutable, and based on biology. Accordingly, determinist thinking about the effects of genes might contribute to more essentialist thinking. So, determinism and essentialism can play together, but they're not the same thing. One might think, for instance, that musical ability is genetically determined, or on the continuum of genetic determinism, without thinking about the category of musician as a natural kind. Or, one might have antitative beliefs about the group Catholics without believing that religiosity is genetically determined. There are also important differences between determinist and essentialist beliefs with regard to how genetic information is used in moral judgments. 
Deterministic thinking conceptualizes the genome as a constraint on one's ability to be or to have done otherwise, which might lead to diminished judgments of blameworthiness. Essentialist thinking, by contrast, conceptualizes the genome as not as limiting what a person can do or become, but rather as constituting who a person really is. Thus, genetic information might reduce judgments of blameworthiness or praiseworthiness if that information is understood through the lens of determinism, but increase those judgments if genetic information is understood through the lens of essentialism. So, what do you think? Do you agree? Examples of genetic essentialism and anti-essentialism. Genetic essentialist thinking about the self is evident, for example, in the slogan that the direct-to-consumer genetic testing company 23andMe uses to advertise its DNA testing kits, Welcome to You. This slogan could be understood by consumers to mean that they will meet or reveal their real or true self on the basis of genome testing results. Genetic essentialism about groups involves, as I have described, beliefs that, among other things, groups are discrete, exclusive, uniform, and have high inductive potential. You can generalize. Accordingly, anti-essentialist text or visual representations of data are ones that emphasize continuous variation, fuzzy boundaries, overlapping distributions, variation within groups, and uncertainty around the prediction of individual characteristics given group membership. And so we see figure two anti-essentialist representation of genetic variation. So in figure two, in the gray are going to be individuals drawn from a diverse New York-based biobank projected onto the first two principal components of genetic similarity of this cohort, emphasizing that genetic similarity and dissimilarity are clinal rather than discontinuous. By contrast, colored dots represent reference panel individuals deliberately sampled from different continental and subcontinental regions, visually suggesting the existence of discrete groups with clear cut boundaries. So here we see figure two. And so in the dots of different colors, we see different regions that are identified. And if we only had those, we might think that there were some discrete groups in this principal component space. Whereas if we take a different reference population and we project them down into this space or we construct this principal component space with people who have different backgrounds from many places in different combinations, then we see a continuum and there aren't any clear places to slice the continuum. And so the author is believing that that will have a different influence on how people think about these different groups. So we've talked about determinism in terms of causal specificity. We've talked about essentialism in terms of two features, the naturalness and entitativity of groups. And now on to the last of the three sections, reductionism. So genetic reductionism. Reductionism is a metaphysical thesis, a claim about explanations and a research program. The metaphysical thesis, that's the first third of reductionism, is ma materialism. People and their minds and their behavior ultimately consist of physical states and processes. There is no extra material or spiritual realm. This, this thesis is not an object of serious debate among scientists. I, I don't even know what to say. Really? It's really not? And why would it matter if it really was or if it really wasn't? Rather, scientific debates center on the latter two components of reductionism. The claim that Higher level phenomena can in theory be entirely explained by knowledge about lower level parts and processes. That is the claim about explanations. So reductionism is a favoritism of claims of higher level phenomena in terms of lower level phenomena. And the final piece is the research program. Phenomena are more fruitfully investigated at lower levels. An objection to genetic reductionism then is an objection to the idea that knowledge about genes and genetic processes could ever be sufficient to explain a higher level phenomena, such as psychotic experiences or depression, or that these phenomena are best studied using genetic tools and methods. And we'll come back to this when we look at Helen Longino's book, Studying Human Behavior, but this is a pretty extreme way to put it. This would be a genetic absolutist who believes that phenomena are best studied or only studied using genetic tools, 
whereas a methodological or scientific pluralist might feel fine with using a plurality of mechanisms to build up a transdisciplinary understanding. Debates about genetic reductionism can produce a dichotomy between two extreme mm -hmm. positions. One extreme position is the idea that genetics or biology more generally can in principle fully explain all facts about human behavior, making higher level psychological or social theories entirely dispensable. The other extreme position is that the social sciences theories of human behavior are fully autonomous, such that lower level biological facts or theories are in no way beneficial to scientific understanding at the higher level. Although it is possible to find scholars who seem to endorse either the extreme reductionist or the extreme anti-reductionist position regarding the relationship between biology and behavior, most uh, scientists who study human behavior concede the middle ground of explanatory pluralism, at least in principle. Explanatory pluralism holds that a complex phenomenon such as human behavior can be understood from multiple overlapping perspectives and scientific studies that differ in their level of analysis, ranging from the action of molecules within cells to the action of governments within nations, can provide complementary information. Citations 55, 56, and 57. 55 is Kendler, Towards the Philosophical Structure for Psychiatry, 2005. Citation 56, Muzinski and Malateri, A Roadmap to Explanatory Pluralism, Introduction to a Topical Collection in the Biology of Behavior, 2021. And then I was very happy to see Citation 57, Longino et, um, book, 2013, Studying Human Behavior, How Scientists Investigate Aggression and Sexuality. And this is a book that we've discussed on live streams before. So I'll just share, this is a stable diffusion, AI generated art. And the uh, prompt for this was me reading and rereading, studying human behavior, integrating insights about methodological and explanatory pluralism. Here are some examples of genetic reductionism and anti-reductionism. Media coverage of genetic studies often use reductionist language. For example, a headline in the Washington Post claimed that our politics are in our DNA, citation 59. And actually the full headline reads, opinion, our politics are in our DNA. That's a good thing. Whereas an article in the Atlantic referred to genetic intelligence tests. So note, the title is called genetic intelligence tests are next to worthless. And not just because one said I was below average. Stating that a higher level social or behavioral phenomena is in DNA or can be measured entirely with genetic information is reductionist because it implies that the phenomena can be entirely understood or is best understood at a lower level of genetic analysis. Even headlines critical of genetic studies can still imply genetic reductionism if the language inappropriately collapses across levels of analysis. For example, genetic intelligence tests. And so here are the closing paragraphs of that Zimmer piece, genetic intelligence tests are next to worthless, and it's quite interesting. Zimmer wrote, quoting Ehrlich, I'm afraid that policymakers won't focus on the real things that bother me about inequality in education, Ehrlich said. Our inner landscape of DNA is an endlessly fascinating place, but we have to also look up and survey the cliffs and chasms of our social landscape too. So there's a lot you could discuss about that. But we have to look up or and we have to look up. What reductionism is not. As with genetic determinism, genetic reductionism is not genetic causation. The disjuncture between causal claims and reductionist claims is more obvious when all of the relevant phenomena are behavioral. The claim that social media use increases depression, citation 61, implies that all other things being equal, increasing the number of hours per day that people spend on social media will on average, make a difference to their probability of experiencing depression. Not that depression is always most fruitfully investigated by measuring social media activity 
or that theories and knowledge about depression can be reduced or recapitulated by theories and knowledge about social media. So that's a really nice example because it shows the kind of structure of a statement where somebody could say that something increases something else, but that doesn't mean that that is the only way to study it or that's the right way to break down a given situation. Given the potential for miscommunication, particularly across disciplinary boundaries, researchers should be clear in their written and oral presentation that they are not using causal language to imply any sort of explanatory reduction. Okay, is there not an implicit explanatory reduction or at least integration of reductionism and holism when we discuss smaller things in the context of bigger things? Here, we get on to the conclusion. So if you're watching, feel free to add any questions in these last several minutes. Conclusion, human genetics is contested science. So a great jumping off question is, in what similar and different ways is insect genetics contested science? The sometimes bitter debates about the utility and ethics of linking genetics with human behavior are complicated by semantic differences in how different academic disciplines use the same words. Consider, for example, the different meanings of the word population for a demographer and an evolutionary geneticist, and in how the lay public interprets academic jargon. Anyone who has attempted to explain the concept of heritability to college freshmen or to a science journalist has likely experienced this semantic difficulty firsthand. That's definitely kind of like a you had to be there moment. I don't know how many people have tried to explain heritability to college freshmen or science journalists, but we've tried to explore heritability a little bit here in these streams and hope to do it more in the future. A few places to look, quantitative genetics and population textbooks, uh, population genetic textbooks like Falconer and Gillespie, paper stream two, where we looked at modularity, genes, development, and evolution. And then a line of research leading back to the heritability hangup, Feldman and Lewinton, 1975, and much, much beyond. And then just a few great population geneticists who come to mind, who have publications and books and articles that advance some of the most rigorous mathematics and most fascinating interpretations of those mathematics. So Graham Koop, Molly Presworski, Michael Torelli, Trudy McKay, Chen Ling Zhu, and Noah Rosenberg, all really creative and productive population geneticists that in their work use heritability in some way or another to different extents. Conclusion. Here's the second paragraph of the conclusion. The author is going to summarize their paper here as we head towards the end. Here, I have attempted to provide greater semantic clarity regarding the terms genetic determinism, genetic essentialism, and genetic reductionism with an aim of improving, even modestly, the quality of scientific discourse about contested areas of scientific research and of scientific communication with the lay public. As described in this perspective, these terms capture well-specified concepts that have been the subject of much philosophical and psychological scholarship, but they are also often used as interchangeable, expandable, and emotionally charged ethical terms that both presuppose and provoke a negative value judgment. Should they? Or shouldn't they? How, how is it presented here? What do you think? In humans? In ants? This semantic muddiness regarding what does and does not constitute determinism, essentialism, and reductionism can contribute to lack of scientific progress and to rancor and miscommunication in vital scientific and ethical debates. Geneticists are encouraged to be careful and precise in their use of words. Determinism, reductionism, and essentialism. How about careful and precise in all the words? But of course, this paper is just about the three words that we've highlighted so much. And geneticists are encouraged to avoid language and data visualizations that might unwittingly imply support for these ideas. So should those ideas provoke a negative value judgment if we don't want to unwittingly imply support? 
or do we only want to wittingly provide support? So where should we wittingly provide support or when? And that concludes the discussion for paper stream three. Just some points to discuss other than, of course, the part about insects is what is scientific pluralism? What is behavioral, ethical, moral, and social pluralism? Just to recap, the paper had an introduction and a conclusion. It's like a five paragraph essay. And the body three paragraphs are about genetic determinism in terms of causal specificity, genetic essentialism in terms of identities of objects and groups, and genetic reductionism primarily in terms of the appeal to explanations and research programs. These are different ideas, they're intertwined, they have a complex history, and they have a complex present and future. So thanks a lot for listening to this paper stream three. Hope that you enjoyed it. And if there's ways that I can improve or you want to go beyond, you want to make your own paper stream or you want to join for 3.1, let's do it because they're important and interesting topics. So until we meet again, just another forager in the determinism, essentialism, reductionism space. Talk to you later.